You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane. We talk about the landscapes of northern Arizona. This is when a lot of the most important gardening is done. It sets the stage for the wake up of spring already. I'm seeing the buds on maples. The leaves are just huge. The uh, flower buds on the apple trees and pears are ginormous. I'm even seeing some of my perennial flowers starting to emerge from the ground. These are sedums, uh, your mums. Uh, so certain things come up earlier than others. They start and so you need to do a few of these steps. And so this show, I want to cover how to prune back grasses, pampas grass specifically, but all grasses in general. I want to prune back perennials. How do you go about that? How far down to the ground do you go? Trees, especially fruit trees and shade trees. We'll cover that. And then lastly, your shrubs, especially native shrubs. Do you need to prune natives or not? How much do you prune them? So we'll go over deep into that. And then I'm sure that'll open up some more things that come our way as well. So stay tuned. We've got a lot in store for you this show. And let me start by just saying, uh, with grasses, should you prune back grasses? Uh, and the answer is always yes. Let's say a pampas grass. They have been absolutely stunning. I just posted a photo on our Facebook page, uh, that last storm that came through, and, and the snow had gotten all the plumes. This, this pampas grass is it's a grass as tall as you and I. It's head high or taller. It's got huge white plumes that uh, just cover the top of this tall, elegant grass. But the snow had come and bent over, taken off some of the fluff. Some of the, It wasn't as, as spectacular. Uh, some of the, the plumes where the stalks were laying over now, that's all an indication that, yes, it's time. And generally, that's going to happen after a storm or two of rain or snow. Uh, as first of the new year, it starts to lay over like that. It's, it's the same every year. For my own pampas grass, we cut those back to about knee, knee high. What happens if you don't cut them back is as we progress through winter, that green foliage, the green blades of grass will turn more brown or be skewed or be spotted or striped or just it looks beat up. So you don't want this new growth to come start erupting up through the old growth and then you're competing. It's not just vibrant Kelly green new foliage. Now it's diseased, rotten, torn, faded, brown old growth intermixed with the new growth, if you just cut it back, now everything that erupts from that, from the base of that grass this year will be fresh and new. That's what you want, especially as we get into March and April, when it's when you've got serious growth going on, all this new, I mean, the peak of spring is happening. You want that grass to be vibrant and new, not intermixed with old, rundown, uh, old leftover foliage. It will also affect your bloom for next summer and fall. So you need to take that old stuff out. So if the new growth is exposed to more sun, you get better plumes. It just works out better. Now, pampas grass is the largest of all of the grasses. It needs to be cut down. I mean, these things are standing. I mean, a dwarf variety is as tall as I am. I'm six foot plus. Uh, a regular variety of pampas grass can go to 10 feet. They're monsters. I mean, children, small dogs, they've been, they've been lost in pampas grass. You need to cut these things back so you get it under control. And you'll cut it back with a chainsaw, some serious sh sharp shears. Uh, you're really getting into it and pruning it back hard. And you'll see at the base, there's this matting or under matting. This curly cue is what I call it. This, this You can see where the old stocks were last year and the new stocks coming up. You want to take back those blades all the way back to there. And I'm saying it's going to be about 12 to 20 inches to the ground. What, what's better, 12 inches or 20 inches? It doesn't matter at all. Just cut it back. Now, I'd say that for pampas grass. I'll say that for most of your grasses, especially misacanthus. Deer grass, Japanese striped grass, zebra grass, most bunny grass, 
fescue, all, all most of your ornamental grasses need to be cut back, much like a perennial's cut back, back to the ground. So most of them, I take mo almost all of mine. I've got a huge bed of blue blue lime grass. It's this tall, maybe knee-high grass, I mean, like silver blue, it's a stunning blue, and it surrounds my strawberry patch. And so it's just, just this contrast. It looks very garden-esque, very designer-esque. But now it's all brown. I just powered up the lawnmower, and I just started walking across it. I've got a, a electric lawnmower, and I just go back and forth, and I mowed them back to whatever the highest setting on my lawnmower was, it was about four inches or so, because it was easy, and it gets me past the rocks. And I would have gone lower if I could. I was afraid of hitting a rock or something I couldn't see. So I'm just mowing it back, back and forth, and that's how I did the strawberries and that blue lime grass. I think most grasses you can cut back in the same manner. Now, some years when I don't want to drag my, my lawnmower back there, it's – it's, I got to take the lawnmower down a, a flight of stairs to the backyard, which is this steep mountain slope. It's a pain in the derriere. Sometimes when I don't want to do that, I'll just take my hedgers. I've got a uh, Roby hedger, 40 volt, greatest tool ever. It's great. If for you guys that like tools, you, you women that just love your tools, gah, that's a great tool. Uh, 40 volt, 40 volt seems to hold up better. The battery stays charged longer. It has more power. It's got a long, I don't know, 20, 20 inch, 24 inch blade where you just hedge things. It's made for like Fotinia hedges, like, like a true hedge, but I find it works really well on perennials. I'll just lower the blade as long as close as I can to the ground. I just start going across the grass area, the perennial bed, the coleus, the coreopsis, the echinaceas, the strawberries, whatever it is, I go as low as I can and I'll rake that up and I'm all done. It's really simple. You do not have to be a professional. And if in doubt, you just simply fertilize it afterwards and, and that fertilizer will cover any mistake you may have, may have made. Okay. That, that's, that's one insider tip. Don't be afraid to cut. You're better off cutting too much than too little. Now, a couple of things to watch while we're on grasses. We just covered how to do pampas, all the grasses. There's a couple native grasses that are evergreen. They keep their foliage. They're always green. One, the, the valley areas are famous for bear grass, like B-E-A-R, like bear, like roar, bear. Bear grass is a native grass. For my native grass like that, it's meant to be evergreen. It's not meant to be cut back ever. It's like an evergreen shrub, only grassy form. But it does have the old spent flowers hovering above the evergreen foliage. What I'll do there is I'll take my hand pruners and I just cut back the spent flower from last fall and summer. I'll cut those out and I, I encourage the growth, more green growth. If it's growing like one of my bare grasses, I trimmed a little bit because it was lopsided. I evened it up a touch, but I don't prune my, my bare grass very much. The other blunder for those new to the Southwest is they'll think their, their yucca and agaves are just like their grass. A yucca is meant to be evergreen. It's not meant to be pruned back, especially your red yuccas or your softleaf yuccas or your Joshua trees. These are some of the fame, the native varieties that grow wild. Your banana yuccas, don't ever prune those back because it can take years and years for that foliage to recover. Watch your gardeners. Don't, they are not, they do not know plants. They're not professional horticulturalists. They don't, they aren't arborists. They're mow and blow guys that come in and just cut things, rake up and walk off. I mean, just, they're in quick. They are famous for cutting back yuccas back to the ground. And then it takes years to recover for bear grass right back to the ground. Years to recover. Don't let them do that. Flag it going, hey, listen, cut all of these out except for this one. Don't cut this yucca. Take the old spent flower out, but don't cut the foliage back. So that's, that's that insider. I'm serious. Really watch that because I see so many blunders in that regard throughout whole subdivisions. You'll see one team going through it butchering everything. Be careful of that. If in doubt, take a picture. If you're doing it yourself, you're just not sure, take a picture with a phone, iPad or something, bring it in and go, hey, should I prune this one back? Is it okay to prune this one? And we'll be glad. We can ID instantly 
which ones need pruning, which ones just need the flower stalk pruned back. Okay, so that, that's how you do grasses. We'll go over trees here. We'll get your garden questions here, here, here shortly. We'll cover how to, how to spray them, what to spray with, how far back to prune back, how much time you've got. We're going deep into pruning this show, but let's get to your garden questions right after this. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. <laughs> Did you know that plants can help you sleep better naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful house plants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Hi, Lisa with the plants of the week and our Goshiki Holly. Goshiki translates from Japanese as holly with five colors. Its new leaves emerge red, then turn green. The entire top of this holly is draped in colors of cream, white, gray, yellow, and green. This evergreen makes the perfect accent, hedge, or evergreen container for its all-round good looks. A really nice plant that shines through winter is just $39. Waters Garden Center, where people who love Japanese gardens, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Okay, we are back in the studio with Lisa Waters Lane. She comes each week with your garden questions. We get questions from, I mean, people don't talk by phone anymore. They don't even (laughs) talk face-to-face. They talk via messenger or facebook messenger or text or now we've got this thing that we do with our family called marco polo <laughs> takes a quick video as soon as you hit stop it sends it off to them and they you're having a conversation face to face it's facetime only you do it on your time yeah and you respond back by video chat mm-hmm. very interesting incredible it snowed what is it, a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. and we're shooting the picture of the grandkids going, hey, it snowed again. We were thinking about building a snowman. Wish you were here. Uh, yaya and Papa. Mm-hmm. And they just thought that was the greatest thing. They'll play it dozens of times before <laughs> they get done and respond back. Yeah, but, it is uh, fun. I like Marco Polo. This, uh, this segment is to respond back to some of those mm-hmm. questions, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or whatever. What, do you, what kind of garden questions are your neighbors talking about? So welcome mm-hmm. back. Well, thank you. Always questions every time of the year. You think sometimes in the winter it would just like, there aren't as many, but you still get good questions. Yeah. So our first one is from Joanne. She says, the deer have been doing a number on my aspen and birch trees. (laughs) One of the trunks, um, the bark is almost completely torn off. Can it be saved? Is there anything I can do? Or should I just wait till spring and see what happens? Oh, no. You need to get on this. So they'll keep after you once. And they invite friends. So they'll have they'll have the whole herd over chewing on. So they'll eat this one branch or trunk or they'll move on to the next. Mm-hmm. And then the bucks, when it get a little bit further in, he'll, they'll get that antler velvet on their yeah, antlers. Rubbing they'll their be antlers. rubbing their antlers back and forth. So you want to keep them off those trees. The one that was damaged can be saved. You want to get on this right away, though. So you come in, and what we'll do is we'll tell you to take a sharp pocket knife, a razor blade or something, and clean that wound up as best you can. You're painting the wound where that opening is with pruning paint. It's a black tar-looking thing. So we're trying to bind it, much like you'd get a scar on your arm, a big flesh wound. We're doing the same thing. Clean it up, bind it up with with the tar, and then we're wrapping it with a tree wrap. It's like an artificial bark. All those things are available here at the garden center. Any of your garden centers, wherever you're listening to, they should have all these parts. Wrap it up. And then we've had great luck. And this is kind of just something we've done over the years. It works for elk and it works for deer. Kind of works for porcupine because they're all all noted for for peeling bark off. Mm -hmm. Wrap that trunk with a light layer of bird netting. This is, this is netting used to keep birds off of fruit 
we just had a wild idea. We had elk going after our, our walnut tree down in Skull Valley. And I went, what am I going to do? These things are going to kill this thing. Lightly wrapped about three times around the trunk and staple gunned it right to the bark. It's this, this netting is kind of floating there. So they couldn't get to the bark anymore. They had to compete with this. And, and I think they get worried about being tangled up in this netting or their antlers getting there. Remember, there's no health insurance <laughs> out in the wild. You're on your own. You break a leg. That is it. Mountain lion bait, hardcore. Yeah. So they're very sensitive to anything different, unusual, being hurt. They just don't know. So I put that on the, and they stopped eating, peeling the bark off of the fruit trees. Right. It really worked well. And with aspens and birch, because they've got that real white, pretty bark that goes up pretty high, you could easily do a, wrap it a few times and keep them off of it. You need to train them to go to your neighbors and eat their aspen, eat their birch, not yours. Right. And once you do that, they'll just be programmed. Go, go this way. Oh, no, we, we, we tried that three years ago. It doesn't work. Go, yeah. Let's go over here. They're very habitual. Very much. Yeah. And then if it's really bad, you might get a repellent. We do have a, it's called repels all. Kind of stinky. You spray the bark and it makes it taste very bitter. Uh, the problem with deer is they've got a stomach system, much like a cow, where they've peeled off several layers of bark before they realize, oh, yeah, this doesn't taste good. It's not settling <laughs> so well. So they've done some damage for the actually before yeah. it reacts with mm -hmm. them. So Yeah, so we did learn to use the bird netting. That being said, we've never had a deer get caught. No, oh bird. no, because <laughs> I know oh, some no. people are going. Oh, the poor deer! You harmed the deer, right? No, we would no, not do that. No, we've never had one get caught in it, uh, but very effective to use because it's lightweight, easy to wrap, yeah. and easy to take off. Very inexpensive. To. Anyone can do it, no matter your age, no matter the scale, the slope, the landscape. It's so easy for fifteen bucks. You, you got the whole thing solved. Mm -hmm. But don't leave it, or they'll keep coming back, and they'll do even right. more damage, and don't they will kill that that trunk. They'll kill it mm -hmm. off. Yeah, definitely. Good advice. Okay, next question is from Anne. She says, the tips of my house plants are turning black. Uh-oh. What could be causing it? How do I correct it? Well, you're the house plant queen. We should probably have you answer <laughs> that one. But dry, it's watering. You always start 80% of all issues are watering. Right. So it's probably that, especially if the furnace is really going. It's got a little cold this week. Mm -hmm. If it's really cycling a lot, it dries out the inside air mm -hmm. so the plants dry out a little faster so my my guess is that get a water meter and just check real yeah. quick and it'll tell you could it be a leaf spot or some of these others it, the other thing that i see some house plants seem to be more sensitive to salt burn oh so, good uh, we can get a buildup of salts in the soil good um so a good way to take Techniques you can use is take that plant to the sink or the bathtub and just leach it. So just let water slowly pour through it for a while. And you're leaching the minerals and the salts out of that soil. Because um, what we find is people water their houseplants like a half cup at a time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not leaching anything out. Yeah. So that's a good way to do it. Um, the other thing is put your water into your... Um, I want to say water pitcher, but that's not it. Your watering Cancer, bucket yeah. and let it sit overnight. And that way any salts in that water will dissipate off. Chlorine, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other one is don't use fertilizers that are high in salt as well. So that infamous miracle grow. Don't stop don't using use that garbage. <laughs> Why would you it's, put miracle grow in your house plants? It's high in salt. Yeah, and if you're it is it, salt. You're just making a problem worse. So. Yeah. Switch to like a Schultz or a Peters, something like that. Yeah, come talk to us. We make a really we make our own. Mm -hmm. It is fabulous. It's more than a house plant size really needs. But if you've got some outdoor gardens and some indoors, it's, get it. Get the waters, flower power. It's like magic. No salt in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if not, they've got the dropper. Like the Schultz has mm -hmm. a dropper thing. There's several yeah. good ones. Just Miracle Grow are none of those. So <laughs> they'll probably give us a cease and assist order. But they're not a sponsor <laughs> of the show or anything. It's just. Again, we're just Ken and Lisa Lane, friends talking yeah. out, out by the driveway right. about house plants. This so, is kind of yeah. what we found. A few tips for you if you're having house plant problems. Uh, Roger would like to know, when should he think about applying the plant protector for scale and for bark beetle? Oh, okay. And also, can you give him an idea of how much he's going to be using per tree kind of sure. thing? Yeah. You're just a touch early. So typically... The end of February, first part of March, whenever you see that first 
forsythia bloom, the daffodils coming up. You'll know when spring's here. The, the willows are starting to grow. That's your cue. Oh, plant protector. We should explain. Roger's a regular. You can tell. So this is a product that we make here at Waters Garden Center. And uh, it made it years and years ago because bark beetle and scale were so bad on the evergreens mm-hmm. that get on the ponderosas, pinion pines. So he's obviously come in for that. You want to put it on just at the beginning edge of the growth so the plant absorbs it and takes it up. Very easy to use. You mix it up in a watering can or five-gallon bucket. You pour it right at the base of the plant. plant absorbs it sub, uh, under the cambium layer and then just taints the sap as the bugs come and eat the plant. Or bark beetle on ponderosas. They burrow in. They're not after the bark. They're after the cambium layer underneath the bark. So it taints that so they don't eat it. How much should you use? That's when, March. Mm -hmm. How much an ounce per trunk of inch circumference measured at chest level or a comfortable level? I just quoted the label because I made it, (laughs) made wrote the label. But it's basically take a tape measure. You need an ounce of product per trunk circumference. So if it's a small tree, a little tiny fruit Mm -hmm. tree, whatever, it's hardly any. If you've got a massive pinion pine or juniper or ponderosa it might take a whole bottle for one tree Mm -hmm. because that the how big is a big tree three feet around that's 32 ounces Mm -hmm. so it just depends that's one take a quick measurement we could tell you and then if you if in doubt try go go light and if we'll have more we always have it we make it ourselves (laughs) we have to we make it here it's called plant protector it's kind of like an antibiotic for plants. But about the time you fertilize, that's also the time you put down the plant protector at the same okay. time. Great questions, Roger. Be right back with Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and orderless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only five ninety nine. dollars now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our McMinn Manzanita. Part of Waters' expanding native selection, this is the big, bold manzanita you find growing throughout Arizona. A local evergreen growing wild with the classic red bark for a style and drought-hardy landscape. Locally grown for local landscapes, this Easy Care shrub is just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love lots of native plants, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Now what was that last week's storm during that snow? Lisa and I were walking the dogs out and about, and and, uh, there there was a Leland Cypress. It was just heavy burdened with all the white snow sitting on top of the the evergreen foliage and this plant was just droopy and i took my uh, my uh, phone went oh this is a good example of why you want to take the weight off of the branches of these evergreens and so i took snapped a picture and said this is why you want to take the weight off of evergreens and posted that to instagram facebook tim tim twitter all of our social media places and some folks said, oh, I got it. Oh, I see that. Oh, yeah, go go take a broom and sweep it side to side and take that weight off. And other folks said, what do you mean? What, what? So let me just explain that. What happens is evergreens can hold several hundred pounds of snow on their branches. This last uh, system was a rather heavy snow. It was very, very moist, which is great for the health of the forest. But it wasn't so so healthy for these big swooping branches. So the, the weight was coming down. The branches were touching the ground. Normally it's, it was perky and upright, probably up off the ground by six feet or more. So when, oh, if you simply take that weight off, the branches will come right back up and you're not going to break a branch. 
If you leave that weight on there and a wind gust comes or a squirrel jumps on it or a deer brushes against it or you just won't look at it funny and it, it'll just snap right off, it'll break that branch off by taking the edge off, taking that weight off of that. Not all the snow, just, just the bulk. It takes the weight off and you'll have less damage. Also, if it gets really cold, so typically after a storm uh, shows up in the mountains of Arizona, right as that storm clears out, the, the skies go crystal clear. Stars are super bright and the cold, the air just drop plummets. It is bitter, bitter cold. Well, if that branch is stuck in that formation, you haven't taken the weight of the snow off, then it gets super cold. Let's say it goes from typically it's snowing at 30 degrees, 35 degrees at high twenties, a low thirties. That's when that's the perfect storm for, for snow. It'll go down to low twenties, teens, single digits, after after the storm clears and that the the sap within that branch can solidify just just freezes like that and many times i've seen more damage caused not by the breaking of a branch but that branch takes on that form because the sap froze that night when it cleared and so it's forevermore droopy like that and so i've just seen that too many times where i'm going huh Wonder why that is, and I figured it out. But but uh, just just for, be aware in your own backyard. Go out, trips around, enjoy the snow. Take the dogs with you. Swoop the, the your biggest prized uh, evergreens: the cypress, cedars, spruce, firs, junipers. The prized ones. Take the weight off, because it'll be you'll you'll be happier. The plant will be healthier and better formed when you do that. You have less damage anyway. Just do that. It, trust me, it works. Now we were talking pruning. And it is time to prune everything in the yard except for one thing. Do not prune back spring blooming plants. So I was walking the yard this week. I noticed the lilacs have ginormous flower buds. You'll see at the end of the branches these huge nodules. Those are flowers. The flowers be formed right now. It forms from late summer through winter. If you go through and prune back your lilac right now, You'll prune off all the flowers. It won't do anything to the health of the plant. It's not going to increase it, decrease it. It will grow and be fine. But you planted that lilac for its flower, the fragrance, the beauty. That's why it's there. By pruning now, you're going to prune off most of the flowers. You're going to prune your spring bloomers after they're done blooming. So lilac typically bloom end of March through April. Then you're going to prune back that lilac in the first part of May, end of April, first part of May. Don't worry. I know it's going to be leafy. It's going to be growing. Everything's spring, but it's okay to prune that plant back at that point. So let enjoy the blossoms first. The same thing applies for forsythia, for azaleas, for rhododendrons, uh, your flowering quince. Anything that blooms early spring, you want to wait until after they're done blooming, enjoy the flowers, the fragrance first, then prune them. But everything else you prune back now. So all of your summer blooming, you know, crepe myrtles and Russian sage and salvias and uh, ro roses, all, all those things that bloom kind of late spring through summer and fall, you prune back right now. So all your fruit trees, you're going to prune back now. Uh, your, your evergreens, if you're trimming those, back now. Your hedge, hedgerows, you're pruning them back now. So that's, that's kind of that one caveat that I'm sharing with you. If in doubt, come talk to us and we'll, we'll guide you in on which ones to prune and when, you know, where and when take a picture of it. I'm, I'm most of our folks here at waters garden center, at least they're Arizona certified nursery professionals. That's way beyond a master gardener. They can ID plants by the bark, by the stems, by the, by an old dead leaf. They can tell what it is. They can tell you when to prune it. If in doubt, come ask us. But again, you can't make a mistake. You're going to fertilize right afterwards. It's, you're just going to grow its way out of it. I just want you to enjoy the flowers as well as a good pruning job. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. 
Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. And back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each, each week and just shares her opinions, which she's full of. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes garden related, sometimes <laughs> on my habits in the backyard. I don't know. Yeah. Your, your pruning <laughs> techniques or something. We have gotten the pruning done. So mm -hmm. uh, there is a little, it looks so clean and fresh and new. That snow <laughs> hit what, a couple weeks ago and just looks so fresh and, oh. There's one oak I want to cut back some more because it grew up high enough. Now it's starting to block the pond. Oh. It's just getting too big. And I, yeah. It's either pond or oak tree. Oaks are a weed. You can't kill them. So I'm going <laughs> to cut that sucker, not down because it's pretty, takes care of itself, but mm -hmm. back. Okay. Some more strategic surgery. I'll make sure I'm gone that day. Yes, that would be a secret because it'll be a chainsaw-induced uh, uh, pruning. Yes. Uh, I, I like how you always prune <laughs> when I'm not yeah. home. You <laughs> have learned that. Yeah. I'll say that for you. <laughs> so anyway, this this is all about you, though, not about mm -hmm. my pruning techniques that you're critiquing, but what, what kind of topic you got for us this week? <laughs> well, I thought we would talk containers again because Good. I have been, we got our first load in in what, December? Yeah, um, right at Christmas. November, kind of December, and we blew through a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so Amy and I went over to find more pottery. So we went out and sh there again, we shopped the yard. We're out there hand, hand picking, picking yeah. looking at colors. How does it look in the sun? Is it going to hold up? Is the quality good? Uh, there's a lot of things that we look at when we go purchase pottery. Yeah. Um, and that is going to be, it's already here. So we're going to be, it's on pallets, not unloaded yet. People be patient, but we're going to have a whole new ton of pottery in to look at. So I thought I would touch on how to best use containers of pottery in your yard. Perfect. I think there's a weakness in the market. I, again, we're a small business, so mm -hmm. we can't compete with the really big boys. So we kind of dance around and spar with the big, the biggest players, mm -hmm. the boxes, all that. Only the weakness, they don't carry anything big. Right. It's all smaller or they're carrying styles that aren't good for us. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, yeah, the buyer and Arkansas ordered one for every, all 500 stores. <laughs> They'll all love it across the country. Right. Well, maybe they won't. And yeah. so, or, or this freeze thaw cycle we have is so hard on pottery. So we're strategically finding some that are larger. Mm -hmm. So we got bigger homes here, bigger properties. So you need something substantial in the back patio or in front of the garage. So you go and hand pick that and just mm -hmm. kind of go, that's the color. That's right. the style. That's bring it on. And the thing I would say when you talk about sizes, big homes here, pottery automatically shrinks the minute oh, you bring oh, it home. It's terrible. <laughs> terrible. You yeah. look at it in the nursery yard and you're like, oh, that thing's huge. I don't know. It's going to be too big. And you get home, you're yeah. like, oh my gosh, it shrank. <laughs> what am I going to do? So you do, you need some big pottery, especially if you're using it by columns, posts. Uh, you need something with some That's size. That's one where in it. if someone is unsure, they're going, oh, I just, oh, I don't know. I think it's too big. I go, just take it home. Trust me. It's yeah. going to work. If it doesn't work, it's too big or whatever. I will take it back. If it's in sellable, I'll take it all back. Right. I've never once one. had one come back, not over decades. Yeah. Cause it just shrink. Like you're saying, it completely yeah. looks big here, but it shrinks down in front yeah. of a, a house or an entry mm -hmm. door, nine foot front door. You need something some taller to make right. that look, to make a statement. Yeah. To not yeah. look like you ran out of money and, you put a thousand dollar in the door and couldn't couldn't buy the right size pot or something. It can look funny. Yeah, it looks off. I agree. I agree. So different ways to use pottery around your yard. Uh, you can use it to create almost like small rooms. So you're using it on a patio if you're trying to create a room effect, an outdoor room on your patio. Use it around the edges or the corners. Um, 
clustered. So using different sizes, so a small, medium, large, and grouping those together on corners will give you that room effect. So are you saying get the entire, because they come nested, you know, big, yes. medium, small, mm-hmm. buy the whole set and then sure. use that as a anchor. That's your foundation, your anchor. Oh. Okay. And I like for that, when I'm clustering my pots together, I like to use the same color yeah. or at least the same tones. I think it gives you a more cohesive look, a better effect for you when you're doing that. Um, so, yeah, definitely buy. They usually come in anywhere from three to five different sizes. Yeah. So don't be afraid to buy that set. If you mix too many colors up, it almost looks like dirty laundry piled up <laughs> or something. Just kind of like there's no mm-hmm. cohesiveness or... or theme or design to it right as soon as you put several together with the same tone or same, just the same pots just stepping yeah. down oh it's like magic mm-hmm. you can also use containers to create almost a hallway if you're trying to guide people throughout your yard or you're trying to keep them away from part of your yard use containers as a as a guide or like hallway. Pillar? kind of what we do on our back patio we have what like a six foot drop off yeah yeah <laughs> off the back deck so we've we've put strategically three or four well probably like six or eight big pots back there so people know oh there's an edge you know yeah. they're not going to just go walk in and take a it's dive kind of a right negative off. edged patio we didn't want mm-hmm. a railing because then it would take away from the view on, of, of the gardens right. the ponds the the dells so we purposely did that And now we just have these great big pots or pieces of art or we've got furniture, all kinds of stuff there. It's quite effective and it's beautiful, just Mm -hmm. stunning. Right. So the other thing that doing pots can do for you is it allows you to grow many different things. So maybe you want to grow an agave, but you also want to grow a rose bush. Well, they have different needs, right? Agaves don't need a lot of water. Um, roses are going to need a little more water, a little more care over time. So putting them in containers, you could have those containers in the same area. You can have them right next to each other, but you can control their environment by how much they're watered and that type of thing. So it allows you to grow different varieties of things in your containers. I find containers just have a fudge factor to them because they percolate or, or drain so well. Mm-hmm. It's out in the yard, solid clay. Yeah. There's no room for air. It's like you're going to yeah. overwater. That's it. Mm-hmm. And a container is so much easier. I find that the hot native stuff does almost better in containers. Hmm. Interesting. Good to know. The other thing about containers, if you uh, want to be able to move them, get a good dolly, yeah. oh, good. A plant dolly underneath them that can sustain some weight on them. But it makes them easy to move around on your patio or your deck. Maybe it's getting, maybe part of the summer it's just getting too hot in a certain spot. You can move that easily and move it into a shadier spot. Or just rotate it around. Right. Turn it like the mm-hmm. euphorbia down in my office. Yeah. A big old cactus. I knew it would kind of lean to the middle of the room. I just, well, I put on a caddy so I can basically spin it around in circles. Mm-hmm. Works great. Right. Right. And so it also, if you, if you're having a party or something and you want to keep people away from certain yeah. part, you can roll it right over there and you can kind of direct them or use them as a traffic flow. Like put a big old cactus in a pot with a caddy <laughs> and you roll it over there and go, no one will mess with They'll this part of the garage. Them. Don't go around the garage. Instead of an orange cone, you have a cactus in a pot. <laughs> but you can also use pottery to emphasize an area. So say you want to emphasize your front door or a walkway. Some of the homes are designed where you come up to it and you're like, well, where's the front door? Yeah, that's <laughs> true. So using that pottery in strategic areas can direct people as to where to go. The trend now is to actually use pottery in the garden bed. Mm-hmm. So as an mm-hmm. accent, these bright blues and jades right. and green, just these bright colors are actually burying it halfway. Or we've got a house where we buried a bright aqua colored pot halfway in the ground, Mm -hmm. put decorative pots, and now that's the rain chain coming off the gutters, comes down and fills that, then overflows Mm -hmm. in the gardens. So it's beautiful. It's art. Right. It's not just a pot. And that's the thing. You can even have your empty pots out there and it creates interest. So even if you've pulled your annuals out of there, your, you know, your petunias are done, but you leave your pot there. It adds color and interest to your yard, even when it's completely empty. And some of the really tall, cylindrical, or um, unique shaped pots out in the yard, you don't even have to plant in them. They're just gorgeous by themselves. The other thing I like the way you can use containers is to put fragrant 
plants in them. If you want them near your doorways or your sitting areas, you know, rosemaries, lavenders, things that have fragrance that you can enjoy when you're outside sitting in your perfect little patio. It brings them up where you can smell them better, stocks mm-hmm. and all that. So that's a great idea. Container gardening, even the winter yes. looks great. We've got pots that just arrived. Uh, that are brightly colored. The 2019 styles are here. Be right back with more with Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Did you know that plants can help you sleep better, naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on Shop, and choose Personal Garden Shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The Personal Garden Shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Let me see if I can dedicate this segment to, to wrapping up this idea of pruning. And two things. One, where do you even start? Two, uh, hedges. Okay, let me see if I can fit all this in. Where do you start? You get an overgrown fruit tree, overgrown hedge, overgrown, anything overgrown. You just look at it and go, I don't even know where to start. It's so discouraging. Let me tell you how I approach that. I always go after, let's say a big butterfly bush. It's just overgrown. It's standing 10, 12 feet tall and you want it down to be chest high. You just, you're going to have to really butcher this thing. Where I start, always start with the dead wood, anything dead or damaged. Just start with that, especially with fruit trees, roses, that kind of, just, just start with the dead material, the damaged material, the broken material, things that obviously are damaged. Start with that. Many times, that will open up the, the structure of that plant that you're pruning where it just becomes obvious what needs to be next. But dead wood is bad because it attracts pests. It attracts woodpeckers. It attracts disease, other insects that burrow into the, the trunk of that tree, and they can kill it. So start with a dead wood. Dead wood is allowed to be pruned out of a tree at any time, out of a branch of a, of a shrub at any time. Anytime you see dead, take it out because it just draws in more disease. Now we're going for the big, woody, overgrown stems or branches, things that are going to the inside on a fruit tree or, or, a, or a shade tree, things that clog up the middle. The inside, you want the light and the air and the wind to go in, be able to get into the structure of that plant. That opens it up so you have less disease, less leaf spot, less mildews, uh, more leaf curls, that kind of stuff. Uh, insects love it to be shaded and moist and all the time. Well, you want to open that up so some sunlight gets into the middle of that. So typically the branches are growing from an outside branch. Let's say you've got a structure of a red-twigged dogwood or, or a purple-leaf plum. Uh, the branches are obviously growing from, from the outside edge, growing right into the center of this thing. We'll take some of those out. Get, that'll open it right up. Now all of a sudden you've got branches growing in the direction that you want. Also, buds, as I'm coming back, I want to cut back that branch. Let's say you've got a three-foot branch. You want to cut back. You want to cut it in half. So three foot, I want to cut it back to 15 inches. And so now I'm going to take, I'm going to, I cut it back to a bud. You'll see a little nodule or knot or 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 just bump in the bark. That's next year's either flower bud or leaf bud. I want to cut it back to one of those, and I want that bud to be pointing in the direction I want that plant to grow. So you can control this, the, the form this plant is going to take on simply by cutting it back to that bud 
and then cut it back at that point. And that bud, all the energy for that branch will now go into that one bud and start growing or erupting. That's a little insider tip. Now, what the book says is cut that bud at a 45 degree angle. So all branches, all cuts should be at a 45 degree angle. I find that's generally a good principle, but if in doubt, yeah, plants are pretty forgiving. Just get it cut back. Focus on the bud more than the angle of the cut at the bud. But generally speaking, at a 45 degree angle, okay? Uh, I've, I've got a, a handout that I'll, I'll print out. I'll use it at, at the class this week. I'll print that. I'll have some waiting for you at the garden center. They're free. Just ask for, Ken said there'd be a pruning handout. It's got pictures of how to prune that. So I'll have that waiting for you. That's how you prune it. But look for dead wood. Then look for branches growing to the inside, uh, clogging up the middle of that plant. Then for, for trees, because I'm six foot one, I want all of my plants in my yard to be pruned above six foot one. I don't want to duck while I walk through my yard. So this is not quoted in the book. This is just me. This is just Nate. My name's Ken. We're just friends. We're talking over the backyard fence, and this is how I prune, and it seems to work really well. I don't want to, to be able to have to duck or hit my head on branches that come down. So even my native juniper trees, I've pruned up to above six foot one. If you're five foot ten, go to five foot nine, just just above head high. If you entertain a lot, go a little taller. You know, you some of your guests will be in the mid six foots. So prune it up a little higher so you have to worry about that. But you should be able to work and play and have fun in your backyard, your front yard, your landscape without having to worry about poking your eye out or bumping your head. So I prune it up. There's no right, there's no right or wrong. Just get it up where it's easier to maintain that kind of stuff. The next one that comes up is, well, Ken, what about my evergreens? Some of my spruce, my pine, my fir, the, some of those branches are right on the ground. Should I prune those up to above head high? The answer is no. What I do with my evergreens is I'll prune them up off the ground until I can get rakes and blowers easily underneath those. But I leave most of the branches right to the ground because you're planting a spruce tree because it looks like a Christmas tree. If you prune it up, uh, up, way up above head high, it almost looks like Dr. Seuss got a hold of it. It looks like it should be in a cartoon. It doesn't look right. Those branches should swoop right down to the ground and, and almost touch the ground, and they will naturally touch the ground. But I want to make my life easier. So I'll prune off that first branch or two off the ground, at the, right at the ground level. I'll prune it right back to the trunk so that I can go in and rake and maintain my yard easier uh, than, than if I just let it hug the ground. It's harder to get things in and out. That's just an insider tip what I do. Uh, I, another one is, okay, so we've got dead wood, things growing to the middle, uh, and then how far up do I prune things, okay? These are simple tips that you should be writing down and just log away in your head or replay the podcast later or whatever. Um, Next, you're going for, and this is mainly for shrubs, some shrubs, as they grow, the trunks become bigger and bigger and thicker and, and, and gnarly looking and real barky and woody. I, I'll try to look at the base of that shrub. Let's say it's a lilac or forsythia or um, salvias or, or sages, whatever it is. I'll go and I'm looking to strategically pull out one or two really old branches. Most shrubs, flowering shrubs especially, bloom better on new wood. Okay, this goes for whatever kind of shrub it is. I'm looking to take just one or two strategic ones out. And now this really opens up the form of that plant. You can really see, if you cut out dead wood, all the intercrossing branches, now you're going for thick old bark. Now it really becomes apparent, oh yeah, this is looking really good now. Now the last step is, I just shape it up. Go, oh, you know, usually they need like a haircut. You know, like one side's a little off from the other. I'll go for those. I just, now I'm just shaping back the plant, the shrub, the a branch that's reaching out to the house. It wants to rub the, the, the shingles on the roof. Okay, that needs to go. During a storm, that's going to cause damage. Well, obviously cut that one, but shape it. So it, so it, now it's 
not competing with the walkway or rubbing up against the shingles or getting up so you can get closer to the windows and rake behind that hedgerow, whatever it is, clean up now. Now it's just form or shape. When you get done, you want to spray everything down with a horticultural oil. So you clean up, you throw it away, you compost, you chip, you do whatever you're doing with all that debris, all the all the clippings. When you're all done, you want to spray it down with a horticultural oil. And here's why. There's insects, or more importantly, there are eggs that insects laid last fall in, in, in your gardens. Aphids and thrip and ciliads and even grasshoppers and roly-polies and earwigs. There's all a host of things out there. Well, you want to prune it back first so you expose more of those eggs and more of those insects that are wintering over there to, your, to this oil. It's very safe. It's all organic. Uh, it's, it's just it's the safest bug killer you can put out there, but it's strong enough to kill the eggs. That's the main thing. So we're cleaning this thing up, and you don't want to use a pump up sprayer. You want to use a hose end sprayer. You need to, it's quantity, not quality. When you put in oil out in the yard, this horticultural oil is safe enough to use. This midwinter mainly is when we use it. I generally try to go when I'm all cleaned up. And I'll just hose everything down so that I'm, I'm starting the spring season out clean. I've got no real insects. Yeah, they can crawl in and fly in and get me later, but at least I'm starting with a clean slate. Then I can maintain that clean, uh, bug-free gardens thereafter. Got more tips for you. Don't change that dial. I'll be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Victory Pyracantha. It's impossible to kill this evergreen shrub. Your garden victory is assured. Birds will nest and revel amongst the cluster of bold red berries. Thick enough to hedge and screen, yet tall enough to use as a windbreak. A big, bold plant is just $59 and sure to impress your garden friends. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love Victory Gardens, they love to shop. Hi, Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Roman Beauty Roseberry. This Mediterranean beauty has graceful, arching branches that flow over rock walls, raised beds, or container's edge. A culinary herb often used in potpourri. Rugged, deer-resistive, evergreen, likes crummy soil, drought, and abuse. Now that's my kind of shrub for under $36. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love unusual, healthy herbs, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Okay, let me wrap up this pruning tip idea so you'll be a pro. These are some things you can actually do right now, this weekend. You can, you can do some pruning and be up your game immediately. That's, that was the goal of the whole show. Uh, two things. One, Roses, I always prune those last, especially if you're into hybrid teas, the, the fancy roses, hybrid teas, Floribundas, Grandifloras, David Austin's, not so much shrub roses, but really the, the grafted roses. You want to prune those in the month of March. So you're still a few weeks early. You want to get past the last real cold snap. And by March, it's beautiful. Things are blooming. It's going. So prune your roses then. I'll go over a whole show of how to prune Roses, because that's a whole technique unto itself. This is more generic than that conversation. Secondly, my hedges. I don't prune my hedges until a little bit later. When does a red tip photinia start to bloom or a, or a cotoneaster or a juniper hedge? Usually that's going to be the end of February. The first part of March is when you start to see the buds elongate, the, the leaves starting to come out. Well, I don't want to prune them back right now, middle of January, because they can look butchered. You can see where the stems, you get a big half-inch branch you've cut off. Well, I've got to look at this cut-back hedgerow for a month and a half, and then it will finally start to erupt with new foliage and cover up all that pruning. 
Well, I, if, if you know that, I'm going to prune back right before it flushes its new growth. So I still have this beautiful new red growth coming out of my red tip photinias, or the blossoms would be better on my cotoneasters or eleagnus or silverberries or whatever that is. Wait, don't be in too much of a rush to prune back your hedges or it just looks like you went through and hedged it all of a sudden. I want to prune back right before they flush your new foliage so it doesn't look like it's as pruned. The, the time frame that it looks like it's pruned is, is shorter. There's not a right or wrong. It's just for my benefit. When I drive down the driveway, I don't want it to go, oh, dang it, look, I made a mistake there. Oh, that was too far. I should have pruned back that, that last year, not this year. So it just drives you crazy if you prune it wrong. If you prune it right before it flushes new growth, yeah, it'll never bother you. We do have a garden class next week, February 2nd, the first Saturday in February, a whole class dedicated to nothing but pruning. I've invited a good friend, uh, Johnny Schaefer from Johnny's Tree and Landscape Service. He's coming to teach that class. He's the arborist that I go to. Now, it'll be more tree-centric and shrubs. We'll try to balance this out. I'll be there with him and we'll take a lot of questions. We're getting it. We're going right to the expert, the local arborist in town, Johnny's tree. And he's got six crews that he goes out and just, just prunes back fruit trees to fire cleanup to big shade trees to evergreens. He's the go-to guy. Uh, we're having Johnny teach this for us. I'll see if I can't snag an interview with him while he's here as well. We'll air that next week just to get that inside. How does an arborist think? What, what's going on on that side, that, that noggin going, okay, how do you approach this? What's step one? What's step two? What's step three? For me, I shared prune the deadwood out, then prune back anything that grows to the inside, open it up so air and light can get to the middle of that shrub. And then prune for form, for shape. If you take that approach, you're good to go. We went a little bit deeper into shrubs. We said, uh, whether it's a rose or, or a salvia or a Russian sage or whatever it is, uh, forsythia, prune back some of that big old wood because flowers, they bloom better on new vibrant wood. And that was our takeaway on fruit trees. And that's what I want you to take home and start to feel confident that you can prune in your own backyard. When you're done, spray the entire yard with horticulturalist oil. It's very inexpensive and it's organic. And then fertilize with all-purpose plant food, 744, right after that. And you've got your yard ready to go for the spring season. All of this week's advice and garden classes can be found at watersgardencenter.com. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Ouch! Aw, oh, man! Another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. We got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.